complicated than files. It's not actually just hanging there, swinging. We actually then pull the corners of the one door, and we all can bolt it onto the next one. So in the end, the whole thing becomes one rigid uh, structure. Now the facilitator was extruded out into these strips that were about three centimeters wide and really long. About actually as long in the case of the bar detector, they're as long as this whole um, the, the width of those strips is basically the spatial resolution of our detector. You guys have had the source of CDF or D0 or something, you've seen that wire chamber that's out of CDF, CDF, that has lots of little wires really, really close together. Well, you do that to get really, really good spatial resolution. You want to be able to detect, you know, exactly where the particles went when they went tracking through your detector. And CDF and D0, they're doing high precision measurements those collision interactions, and they really, really need fine-grained detectors, right? They have the, those wire chambers, which is the outer thing. They can hit these silicon chips with little 25 micron strips on them, because that's like the wires. So they have very, very good spatial resolution. And they pay for that. The more <laughs> the better spatial resolution you have, the more expensive your detector gets. Every little channel you have has electronics on it. In fact, we price these detectors by uh, how many hundreds of dollars per electronics channel? If you have 20,000 electronics channels in your detector and it's $200 per channel, it's a lot of money. It's half, almost half a million dollars right there. So, and that was just for your electronics. That didn't include the steel or the support or anything. So anyway, so the point is that you tend to design a detector with the amount of spatial resolution that you need and no more. That's, the cost. that's, that's what ends up costing. So in Minos, those strips, it's a very, compared to the colliders, it's a very large resolution. It's, but, but for us, those strips give us a resolution that's about a centimeter. For this experiment, that's as good as you need. We don't need to know exactly where the neutrino was, or exactly where the little shower particles was, or exactly where the, where the muon went. What we do care about is how much energy got deposited by that neutrino. We want to know the energy of the neutrino that came in. Um, that's part, part of our measurements. So it's not just counting how many neutrinos we see, it's counting how many 1 GeV neutrinos compared to 2 GeV neutrinos compared to 3 GeV neutrinos. Because the rate at which the neutrinos will change flavor between here and Sudan is partly dependent on their energy. So we measure a spectrum, basically. Now a neutrino, when it comes in and interacts with the detector, it basically gives up nearly all of its energy to Visible particles that you can measure in your detector. So this is a big calorimeter, is what they would call it. Calorimeter is a piece of detector that will measure energy. And the way we do that in the scintillator, it also dictates why we chose the plastic scintillator. When a part, when a charged particle goes through this plastic scintillator, it's been doped. So it excites this this doped material, this doping material. It excites those electrons in that material to an excited state. So the, the, the particle that we're that we're acting, that just goes through. Now that the, 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 the doped material doesn't want to stay in the excited state, it will eventually decay back to its normal ground state. When it does that, it lets off the photon. And that photon is now captured in this scintillator. Um, eventually goes into a light fiber. There's light fibers running down the middle of each, each guy. The light fibers are guided out the side here into
had light transmission, fiber optics. We had, I forget, I'm not going to say the right number, but it's four or five hundred miles.